Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last hangout of the season. Uh, I am uh, here in World of Warcraft in a very uh, Mount Neverest setting here, uh, which is up in Kung Lai Summit. So we figured that uh, what we're looking at now is uh, we are wrapping up today on the last day of the quest line uh, here on December 21st. So uh, basically... What we have for you today is looking at some slideshows, uh, and we're going to be talking about the rise of the math mancer. This is a wrap-up hangout. Really what we're going to do tonight is we thought about it. We said, hey, we have lots of quests for them, so uh, why don't we go ahead and cover a lot of the, the little questions we pose to you and sort of say how we solve them. But first, I also would like to introduce my co-host here today, and Kay. So go ahead and uh, say hello. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I am still at the Shrine and as you can see in World of Warcraft they do celebrate holidays because both Chris and I's avatars are wearing our ugly Christmas sweaters. Yes, they are, they are very important Christmas sweaters, especially um, in the fact. And the nice thing about them is that if you click on them, they have you do some caroling. So you can have yourself caroling, get a little musical notes there, uh, to get everyone in the season because what's math without music? So well, we'll go ahead and we'll start off with tanking by numbers. So uh, for those of you that uh, are doing the quest line, this is sort of what you so to sort of bring you back and refresh your memory. It's looking at uh, you had to take one of the following tanks or two of the following tanks and decide which ones would you want to actually go ahead and serve as the tanks, the main tank and the off tank, for the Galacross boss in the Siege of Ogrimmar fight. And then using the numbers, why would you make that decision based on the numbers, and who did you eliminate and why? So, we'll just sort of walk you through this process, just like a normal word process. Basically, with the Galacross fight, there are several phases to the fight. Uh, the phase one is basically the entire group will fight. Phase two, a demolition engine comes down and you have to destroy it. And then one group peels off, uh, a tower group, which is typically, three, it's typically five individuals, will peel off and they will capture the south tower, while the rest of the group continues fighting in the middle. Then in phase three, a second demolition, demolition engine comes down and is destroyed. And then the tower group again, uh, but this time they head north and they capture the tower in the north. Um, so the next thing that you're looking at is that um, those two towers then, there's guns on top of the towers, you hit the boss, it knocks the boss to the ground, and then everyone drops down to the middle of the field and, and beats on the boss. So that's sort of the general overview of the fight. So first of all, you had to do your research on the fight, and that was really the first step. Figure out the fight, figure out some of the numbers that are there, and sort of start formulating a strategy based on on that, knowing that that type of fight. Sorry about that, I might cut out. So next thing is, you had to think about what does it need to have a tank. So with the ground group, because you're, you're staying in combat for a long amount of time, really the thing you focus on is you want, you want a tank that has lots of health and that does a high amount of area effect or AOE threat because there's lots and lots of groups of, of uh, enemies that are coming at you, wave after wave after wave. In the tower group, uh, you want to have a tank that has good health and good avoidance, because you want to dodge a lot of damage. And the other key factor with that is to have a high single target threat. What I mean by that is that the tower crew is different. Typically, in a, to in a tower piece of the fight, you're only fighting a handful, one or two, at uh, the most three individual mobs at any given time. So. It's a lot lower numbers. The tank that's down in the middle is, is handling is handling five, six, ten uh, different ads all the time, depending on how fast the group is downing uh, the ads. Then the other thing you have is then you have the Galacross phase, which is a little different because now it's a big, huge boss, and you want the you want lots of health in your tanks. You want, you want really good self heals to help the the healers out because at that point in time they're running out of mana, uh, and you also want to make sure they have a high single target threat so they can keep switching and swapping uh, Galacris back and forth so that way you don't have any given any tank sort of taking too much of the damage. So, my selection, um, based on that group of, of, of tanks that we had, is I would pick Kawapi and Konoshiki. 
uh, primarily due to the fact that they have the highest gear score and the highest stats out of all the ones that are there. Um, that's really sort of what you're, you're seeing in, in a lot of those. If you went back and looked through them, you would definitely see Kowapi and Konishi gear definitely standing out uh, when it comes to their average item level as well as the amount of health and the amount of stamina they have. So for the ground tank, the ground tank's kind of fun. Um, I would I would say that Kunoshiki probably would make a superior ground tank, uh, but I don't know if she agrees uh, because of her AOE threat generation because she spins. Uh, so that's the nice thing about monks is they have a really good amount of threat that they can generate by spinning, and that allows them to do a lot of damage and to a lot of the of to a lot of mobs in a very short amount of time, which means that she gets lots and lots of aggro. So the, the key for her would be getting rid of, uh, of the, the damage and avoiding the damage as much as possible. But I think that that's really important because it would keep that off your healers, it would keep that off your high DPS, and, and also it would help do uh, some other things. On the tower team, uh, obviously if, if Konoshiki is the ground tank, then obviously uh, Kuapi would have to be the tower tank. And then the reason is is because as a big warrior... Um, Kwapi has a, lot, a very good ability to do a single target threat, and he has lots of blocks with his shields and, and different things like that, so that way he can go ahead, and apparently now he's still singing. Uh, but the other thing is that he can go ahead and, and basically use that big old shield that he has. And a lot of the sword and board just beating on people, and that's really sort of what warrior tanks do really good. Uh, and so that's the thing about it. The other nice thing about it is that uh, he's very good at grabbing uh, a moderate amount of aggro because remember, what's happening is you're splitting out uh, from each other. Uh, the other thing that I say about the warrior is he also has something called Rallying Cry, which is something that if the tower team gets low on health because of line of sight issues or the healers get stuck somewhere, um, basically that helps give everyone a little bit of boost and stamina to try to get the, let the healer catch up. So those are some of the things that we thought about with, with that portion. So so the other thing that's there is really the interesting thing about it is is primarily actually um, either one of them could probably perform the role, uh, whether it was the ground or the tower. Uh, there would be some changes that need to be made. For instance, Kwapi uh, would have to do uh, basically go ahead and change his talent to give him more AOE threat if he was going to be the ground tank. So uh, the two main threat pieces out there are Bladestorm and Dragon Roar. So again, those are things that, that uh, we would just have to to look at switching things out. And that's one of the interesting things about World of Warcraft and about fighting in the endgame is that, is that really you're always looking at different combinations of stats and different combinations of abilities. So that way your character can be optimized and that way your character continue to, to optimize to a specific fight. So you're always changing some things around. The other thing I'd have Konoshiki do is I'd have her switch out of her, her tiger and I'd have her switch to Rushing Jade Winds if she was the ground tank. Because the other thing about that is with the rushing jade winds is she can simply click on that button uh, and she'll do the spin because what it does it replaces her spinning crane kick, which is what she was showing you uh, earlier. And instead, it replaces it, her, it replaces it with a big vortex of, of wind around her that does lots of damage. And the thing is, it still allows her to do a lot of her mitigation abilities while she's doing that spinning or while she's doing... Uh, that, that portion of the fight. So she can help drop a lot of that uh, the damage that comes her way. So that's kind of the different uh, fixes I would, I would suggest to doing it. Um, so basically we'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, next up was uh, dividing up the loot. Dividing up the loot was basically talking about, okay, you're going out and you're doing Zandalari Warbringers and you're going ahead and trying to divide up the loot and you had to come up with a system that would equitably distribute the loot. So uh, one of the things we looked at is uh, basically going ahead and figuring out how we're going to distribute that loot. So given the variability of the drops and the rarest of the mount that was shown there as well, because remember there were there several different pieces there, really the big thing for this is that this is sort of that prior planning. This is, this is really what you want the group should do before you even start going out to get the Warbringers. Uh, there's basically three separate classes of items. And the interesting thing about the dividing up the loot problem, and that's just kind of similar to the first problem we had you as far as tanking by numbers, is it's very much more of a logic type of problem. It's not necessarily, you know, we, we want you to, you're definitely looking at numbers, but a lot of it is logical thought. A lot of it is, is just looking at process of elimination. You know, for instance, the bigger the number, the, the better the character will perform. 
So that's sort of something that you're seeing with with uh, the reason why we I selected Konoshiki and Kuapi because that's sort of the heuristic, the rule of thumb that's there in World of Warcraft is that the higher your gear score is, the better your performance should be. Now, it doesn't mean it's always there, but the better your performance should be. Dividing up the loot, again, it's more of how do you use your logical thought process to go ahead and develop a way to, to equitably distribute this wealth in a way that, that seems very, very fair to everyone involved and also respects the fact that most of this stuff here is going to be very, very much random. You're not necessarily guaranteed a specific amount of item or a specific item will drop. So one of the things we look at is there's three different types of classes of items, and those classes are stolen insignias, which increase reputation for specific classes. You get sacks of loot, which contain, which is a rich randomly generate uh, when you open them. You can get herbs, leather, or or cloth. Uh, again, they're not specific, so it's not necessarily you're guaranteed to get anything specific for that. And then of course there's the mount, which is an extremely rare drop. So you might have to kill lots and lots of warbringers before a mount even drops. Uh, and sometimes, obviously, because it's random, you might kill the first one you kill, might drop a mount. So those are things that you have to think about and try to start organizing and, and, and trying to develop your fair system. So first of all, uh, we have to make an assumption here. Um, that's something else that, that, that's not necessarily stated in the question, but you have to make an assumption. So the assumptions I made was that there is no guild need. So therefore, what I mean by that is that um, no one running in the group is, is a crafter that, that the guild absolutely needs to have maxed up. And so if they were, so for instance, if you had a tailor or a leather worker or a blacksmith in the group um, that were trying to get leveled to 600, then uh, basically we'd obviously distribute the loot that's useful for, to them to that individual. Um, the, the, with, the rep, with the reputation stuff, um, there are patterns that drop from specific factions that are needed um, by the guild. By, so you need to have someone in the guild that can do that. Otherwise, you're spending lots and lots of gold on the open market. So these are some assistance, assumptions that I made. So first of all, there's no guild need. Because otherwise, if there was a guild need, that would trump everything else. The next step, I, assumption that had to be stated was this. We had to agree that everybody that their main character needs trump their secondary characters. In other words, what happens is that it's greater importance to the guild that your guildie's main is geared up more so than your alt. And what we mean by that is that um, an alternate, remember, is is the basically the character that you are going ahead and you're creating that's not really the character you play all the time. It's another character. Maybe you made it for fun. Maybe you made it to uh, help support the first character. But that's what I'm talking about here with this, is that the main character trumps the alt character. So, stolen insignias. Again, they increase reputation. Uh, The next thing we do for that first class is we decide to start defining the parameters for that first class. So again, we're building in that logical thought. We're building in that mathematical knowledge. We're going to say, now we can think logically. Now we can go ahead and start going, okay, this is, this is our way of thinking about this. So first of all, we ask me to have everyone in the group determine what their reputation is for all the relevant factions. So the factions are listed there, Shadow Pan, Klaxi, Golden Lotus, and I guess Celestials. The next thing you do is you would determine the needs of the guild and set a minimum reputation, reputation standards for each faction. This goes back to what I just said about how some factions have recipes that you, you may need to... Um, allow you to do enchants or, or make weapons or do different things like that for the guild. We also have to agree that anyone who already meets the minimum standards will not rule need on those insignias. In other words, if you already have met the, in the minimum standard, then then you don't need that anymore. You can greed on that. So, uh, and basically what it is is that there's a, there's two, there's three different ways you can, you can basically roll for these insignias. The first is pass which obviously is you're not going to roll on it. The second is need, which means that um, you need it. And last is greed, which means you want it. So needs and wants are are broken out separately in the game. And so needs uh, have basically priority over greeds, and greeds obviously have priority over um, passes. 
So the other thing about it is we agree that everyone will use their insignias to allow for an accurate tracking of rep. So in other words, once you, once you pick it up and once you earn it, you click on your rep, and what's happening is as you're moving around, everybody's keeping track of the rep, and everyone's letting everyone know what the rep is. So communication transparency is very, very, very important uh, to this trust factor. Uh, then once someone reaches the minimum reputation, they'll no longer roll need on that assignia. They can still roll greed. And once everyone has reached the minimum rep, then everyone rolls greed. And once you get to that standpoint, greed, ha greed goes ahead and uh, basically jumps around, and uh, it's just random number generation of rolls that you get. And you, you can just basically go from there. So the nice thing about that is then what happens is that once everybody has their needs taken care of, once everybody's at the minimum reputation, then we're greeting, and then it's just sort of up to your RNG gods to determine whether or not you, you'll get it or not. So that's sort of what you're looking at there for the stolen insignias. Now the next thing is kind of interesting. The sacks of loot, again, they drop herb, leather, or a cloth. There's no guarantee of what will be in the sack. In other words, you don't know until you open it. And once you open it, then it basically tells then basically you'll see what's in there. So the biggest thing again, determine it ahead of time. So for instance, um, basically what you're seeing is trying to figure out. So if somebody really needs herbs uh, to help the guild out or to level their profession, uh, that again would be looking at the at the guild. Uh, remember this was a guild run, so that's something you're looking at as well, is that you're always looking at how to benefit the guild, the group, the whole, the organization. And so then what happens is you just figure out what you want to do with that. So you'd break out, okay, so all leather goes to this person, all ore goes to this person, or per sons, because you can actively distribute it because you'll be able to see how much leather you get from the sack, and everyone in the group gets to see how much comes through. So that's a nice transparency there is in the, in the, in the party group. And then basically what you have, once you've gone ahead and decided that, I figured it's better just to let everyone else roll need, or let everyone roll need on the sack because it gives them, lets them win something. There's something about winning something. I mean, if you're, if you're going to play something for, for if you're going to do something for two, three hours, you do kind of want that ability to win and that feeling of winning, that fiero moment, that yes, I got something. Even if you turn around and give it back to somebody else. But at least you won something. Uh, so basically, you know, in my model, it would be basically having everybody roll need on the sacks. Uh, so everyone gets a feel that they, they can go ahead and um, earn something. So now we're up to the third and final class of drop that could come from that piece. And that's the mount. Uh, the mount is very, very rare. So what I would say is uh, basically, if, if I was running the group, I would make sure, I'd check and make sure to see, number one, does anyone already have the mount? Because if you have the mount, then then it really doesn't make sense for you to roll to get a second mount. Because in World of Warcraft right now, your mounts that you have are shared with all of your, with all of the tunes that you have and all the servers that you're on. So, so really you don't need to have any more than one of, of a specific type of mount. So, then next is, is that you decide on your hierarchy. Again, you're building that logical structure. Um, there's a hierarchy of need you're looking at and saying, okay, those without mounts trumps those with a similar mount. And then one of the things that we, we talked, especially whenever we did this type of thing, is we developed a point system. The idea was that for every attempt on the Warbringer, we basically assigned a, a specific number of points. And what it is, is that, that by doing this, it allows a pool of players to rotate in and out. Because again, this is an extremely rare drop. And so what, we, what our suggestion would be is that the players move in and out Obviously, if everyone has zero points, then everybody rolls need on a mount that doesn't have it. And then uh, that person who, who gets it, obviously, uh, will drop out of that pool of those without the mount. So it's very, you know, either have or have not. It's a very nice binary decision method. So next up you have is that you must be present to win. It's just like the lotto. It's just like, oh, I shouldn't say that. It's just like you know, a lot of your Christmas parties, actually, now. You have to be present to win. Uh, so basically the person has to be in the group and the reason for that is whenever the mountain drops you can only share it with people who are currently in the party that you're in. So you have to be present to win. And the other thing about it is coming up with a system that's transparency with the tally of points. And so that could be on a guild website, that could be on a, an Excel spreadsheet, that could be shared with people, uh, it could be something that you're just maintaining in chat uh, and a log. So basically you assign someone to do those points and assign those points. So that's different ways to go ahead and come up with the transparency so everyone knows whose points is where. 
And then obviously, as you're tracking points, as people move in and out, totals are going to change. People are going to get them out. People are not going to get them out. Um, and so what's going to happen is you're going to be able to get smaller and smaller pools of people who don't have them out, and then you'll basically go through it and uh, figure out um, you know, where everyone goes and start going to do your process of elimination. So now, if it's a fresh start, everyone rolls knee that does not have the mount. Anyone that wins will not be able to roll knee again until everyone present has the mount. Uh, the reason for this is there are actually different colors of that mount. And so what that does is allows the allows the people to have possibly, uh, I believe it's up to four different colors uh, of that mount, of that, that uh, dire horn mount that people can go ahead and uh, um, collect. So uh, basically that's what you're looking at. So um, for first off, everyone gets a mount. Second off, then we let people roll need uh, if they don't have that color of mount. Then if it's an existing group, uh, then basically obviously what you'd be doing is whoever has, happens to have the highest amount of points would roll need and everybody else would roll greed. So again, if you have someone who is tied with points with somebody else, obviously as long as the other person does not have the, the mount either, uh, then they would go ahead and they'd both roll for the mount, roll need for the mount. So it's quick, easy, efficient, simple... Uh, decision-making method. So the next step is the 550 challenge, and uh, so what we're, what we're taught to do is talk about selecting a character in Neville Trail, and then based on their, their current level, devise a strategy on what they need to do to get their average item. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over quickly to uh, Konoshiki to have her talk a little bit about um, how she came up with this challenge and sort of, and, and why, why it was top of mind for her when she created this challenge. Okay, um, we started the, it, it actually started in our guild as the 530 challenge. So, so meaning, how are you going to get your item level up to 530? And the reason why we did this is we wanted, this is, was especially for our raiders. So raiders are people who uh, have been doing the end game play. So, so the people who have really been putting in hours, collecting gear, learning the moves, constantly looking at what we showed you in, in all those videos, because all those videos we had you look at was so that you understood what was happening at Endgame and the, the complex mathematics, statistics, probability, and modeling that any player of WoW has to do, whether or not you know whether or not they're cognizant <laughs> of the fact that they're that they're doing so much math. So the, the thing of it is, what we did was we asked all of our players who are raiders, so, so meaning that they had the highest level skills in our guild, we asked them to start um, looking at trying to get their item level up to a certain amount. And this would assist the guild in, in downing whatever challenge that, that we had to go up against. So um, what we really did was we said, look at what you have, and what's your strategy for getting up a higher item level? Whether you did this by, by doing some solo play or whether you gathered a group of guildies to help you with this, that was, that was the idea for the 550 item level challenge. All right, and so our last hangout, we talked about average item level. And there are 16, item, uh, 16 gear slots. And remember that uh, the two-handed weapons do count as two slots, so there's a little bit of a cheat there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So um, these are the slot items, so helm, neck, uh, shoulders, cloak, chest, wrist, gloves, waist, legs, feet, first ring, second ring, one trinket, first trinket, second trinket, main hand, and an off hand. Sorry, it just sounded like 12 days of Christmas. Uh, next thing is um, average item level. Remember, there's two numbers. You find it on your character sheet. Under the general tab, uh, the first number is equipped, and the second number is in bag. So that's another way you could have looked at coming up with a 550 challenge is you could look at num amounts in bags. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you can pick up gear um, that you can't necessarily use on one spec, uh, but you can use in your off spec, and you can always have those in your bags, and that could boost up your item level a little bit. So again, that's another little uh, exemption you can play with. So whenever I approached this challenge, um, basically what happened um, is I really thought about going, well, why don't we just do backwards by design? We know exactly what we want. It's confirmed. We want a 550 average. We know that there are 16 slots. 550 times 16 gives you 8,800 total item level points. So now we need to know, okay, now how can we efficiently get ourselves 
what's the fastest, most efficient way to get ourselves to this 8,800 points as possible. And so part of what was playing around with that is figuring out how do we go ahead and how do we develop this. So um, that's the kind of fun thing that's out there and saying, okay, well, obviously, um, now we're talking about an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so <laughs> now remember, here's sort of where the gear items come from and where the gear item levels are. So, again, this would be you researching and knowing the game. Uh, and, again, this can be found on any of the game sites that are out there or by going into, your, into your, your tune and clicking on the dungeon journal. That will go ahead and let you look at that. So, first off, uh, the LFR, the Looking for Raid Siege of Agrimar, drops 528 gear, which, if you spend 500 Valor points, you can upgrade eight levels to level 536. We talked about upgrading in our last presentation as well. So then what we have is we have um, the Timeless Isles plus, their token, plus the Burden of Eternity. This is something that's a little different. So with that, um, you get uh, the Timeless Isles running around. You get tokens that turn into 496 gear. However, if you use a Burden of Eternity, which is an extremely rare, rare piece, uh, or you can buy them for 50,000 uh, Timeless Isle coins, which you pick up after you know doing opening chest, uh, basically doing anything on Timeless Isles, you pick up coins. Um, so if you get 50,000 of those, you can buy a Burden of Eternity. And what you can do is you can go ahead and you click on, use that on a token, and you get a, five, a randomly generated 535 piece um, that's the same type of gear as the token was. So in other words, if it was a wrist token, you would get a 535 wrist piece. If it was a head as a helm token, you get a 535 helm. Now you can go ahead, you can go ahead and turn that in, you get 543. So now we're getting closer to 550. Then there's another phase. Siege of Ogre Mar, again, that's another raid. There's a new version out there called a flex version of that raid. And that, if you're successful there, things that you kill there drop 540 pieces, which can be upgraded to 548. Then lastly, we have um, the 553 gear. Now there's three different ways to get 553 gear. First of all, you can run 10 player or 25 player normal, and you can get uh, you may get 553 gear that drops off the bosses, uh, and that can be upgraded to 561. Next up, you can also have, if you have crafters that are out there, so tailors, uh, blacksmiths, and leather workers, they can go ahead and they can create now crafted belts and pants uh, that are 553 item levels, and basically, uh, again, can be upgraded to 561. And lastly, you can also go ahead and on the Celestial Isles, uh, uh, basically where the Thomas Isle is, uh, there's actually a Celestials there, where you can fight with those Celestials, and uh, they have a chance of dropping 553 tier uh, hands and legs. Now, tier is important because basically if you have two of those, two piece, a two-piece tier set gives you bonus stuff. A four-piece tier set gives you more bonus stuff. So that's really good. So, so ideally, you'd want to have the tier sets uh, because it gives you lots of bonuses to play around with. But again, they drop off the Celestials. They're 553. Uh, and you can upgrade them to 561. So again, this is research you had to do in the game. You had to go out, research the game, and find this information, or just sort of watch our Hangouts, because uh, we also gave you a lot of this information in the, the last Hangout. Now, as always, all, all really good word problems. Um, you know, you have two tanks approaching 555 challenge, and you have to have constraints. So what are the constraints that are out there? So first of all, those Valor points you use to upgrade your gear, you're limited. You can only do 1,000 Valor points each week. And remember, each upgrade costs you 250 Valor points. So for, the two, for two upgrades, it costs you 500. So at the most, in a given week, if you had your 1,000 Valor points each week, you can only upgrade, uh, you can only upgrade two pieces up the whole, eight, or the whole eight item levels. The other thing about this is that there's a lot of randomness in this game. So that's something else you have to think about, is that a lot of the gear drops are extremely random. Um, and you may not get it, because there's also the option of, and, and World of Warcraft, they don't necessarily give you nothing uh, that drops off a boss. They, their version of nothing is gold. And so you might get gold instead of getting the piece that you actually want. Um, so there's no guarantee that any, any sort of gear will drop. You will get something, but that could just simply be gold. 
Um, and so that's something you have to think about as well, is how random, the building in this randomness into your model. So obviously the best the best choice, the best way to go about it, is one that tries to eliminate a lot of that randomness. Next up, uh, again, we talked about the Celestials that drops the 5-inch gear, but remember, they can, but, but they can only do that once a week. You can't continually kill them every day or over and over and over again and hope you get a drop. You can't do that. You only get one time, one chance at it uh, during each week. Now, what you can do to help increase your chances, so you can go ahead and you can basically go, go by running around, you collect tokens, and you can trade these tokens in once a week uh, to buy Warforged Seals. Uh, however, you can only buy three Warforged Seals at a time and only three each week. So uh, you can only do it once a week again. So it's another one of those once a week things. Uh, and what the, the Warforged Seals does, it gives you a separate... Um, roll allows you to, 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 to get a second chance at getting gear from a specific boss or a specific item. So, so instead of just being one and done, now you can choose if you want to use a bonus roll to see if you can get that gear. So it helps increase your chances a little bit, uh, but again, it's probability. It's not cumulative probability either. So uh, you still have the same, amount, same probability of getting something as you would on the original roll. There's no difference between that. So you're just as likely to get gold as you would be on the original roll. So again, so a lot of the, again, we're talking about that randomness constraints that are there. Now here's some other things. Crafters can make a 553 belt and pants. However, you also have to remember that it takes, basically, uh, if you're a crafter, it takes you 21 days, so three weeks, to make a belt, and it takes you four weeks to make a pant. So I don't think, so remember that a lot of this stuff is either it's going to take you a long time, or if you're the crafter, or you're just gonna, they're going to want lots of gold for it um, if you're not the crafter and they're not a guildy. Um, so those are things that you just have to uh, be aware of. And it will take time. In fact, you know, obviously the 5 feet challenge will take time for everybody to get there. Now there's something else out there, the legendary cloak. There's a legendary cloak you can get uh, that has a 600 item level. It can be earned. Uh, however, it takes a ton of time to do it. You have to get exalted with the Black Prince. You have to get exalted with the Emperor of the Timeless Isles. You have to do a lot of quests. You have to do a lot of dungeon running to get specific uh, items, tokens, and rewards that uh, are being asked of you, of different quest items that come from there. So, um, But, however, you will get it. It's just a matter of it will take you time to get it. So um, basically this is an example that's out there. Um, really, so there's two models that are here. Um, you have the non-legendary cloak model, and you have the legendary cloak model. And so this is sort of what I was looking at. Um, the interesting thing about it is the non-legendary cloak, the pretty much the closest you can get to that 8800 is being two points above it. Um, and, and for the, the legendary cloak, however, you can actually get to um, right exactly at um, 8800. So, so that's the different, those two different versions that you see here. That so you can either go for the legendary cloak or be without the legendary cloak. Obviously, the legendary cloak uh, gives you a 600 piece, which really helps and very nice to build, bring you up with the stats. So, if it's 600, you can you can have a lot of le lower pieces to it. So, I'm sort of shading my way here. So, sort of here's how it rolls out. If you don't have the legendary cloak. You need to have one four, uh, 543 piece. You need to have 12 four, uh, 548 pieces. Uh, and so that means you need to get 12 pieces from flex gear. So that's something that you're, you're trying to figure out. So, and also, on top of that, you have to upgrade those flex gear pieces twice. So therefore, it's going to cost you 6,000 uh, Valor points total. Uh, and then the other thing about it is you need to have... Um, you know, like we said before, is is now, and I will say here's a caveat. Um, I say 12 here, but the next slide here, it says 11 or 12. And here's the reason why I have two slides that say almost exactly the same thing. It's that two-handed piece. Remember, if you are a class like a druid or uh, your DPS warrior or somebody who has, who uses two-hand weapons, then really you only need 11 for 548 pieces. So then you can go ahead and upgrade them. So, so there's something else that's there. Um, and with the 11 pieces, you would have, you, that only cost you 5,500 
valor points that are there. So again, that little that two-hander does help you, um, you know, cheat a little bit because remember that the if you have a two-hander, it counts twice. And then it also, in addition to all that, you would need to have three 561 pieces. So it could be a crafted belt and then the 553 celestial hands and legs, or it could be a crafted belt and legs and one piece of the celestial um, item. So obviously it would have to be the hands if you already had the belt and the leg. And then you'd also go ahead and upgrade them twice. Now with the cloak, you obviously need the cloak. Um, and that would be six, that would basically be a 600 piece. You'd upgrade it twice to be 500 valor points. You would also then need one 532 piece, which is basically a, a 528 um, LFR gear piece. You upgrade it once. And then you'd have to have two or three pieces that are 536. Again, the reason why it's two or three is because of the two-handed weapon. Um, so basically, if you have the two-handed weapon, that counts as twice, and so it does reduce the cost as well. You'd also need to have three 543 pieces. These are the 496 tokens uh, plus the Burden of Eternity. And then you would only need five flex gear pieces, uh, 540 pieces, to go ahead and, and pull from that. And last but not least, you need to have the 361 pieces. Uh, again, they could either be the belt and then the hands and legs from the Celestials, or it could be the belt and the pants and then the Celestial hands. Um, so those are different ways to go ahead and, and grab that. If we want to compare it, here's what happens. With no cloak, with no two-hand required, basically with no two-hander, it requires 8,000 Valor Points to do all the upgrades. If you want to look at the cloak, no cloak with a two-hander, it only costs you 7,500. Again, if you're going to go with the cloak and no two-hander, it's 7,750. If you're going to the cloak with a two-hander, it's 7,250. So basically you can see that the legendary cloak one does end up costing you less valor point-wise. Uh, but again, it depends on how lucky you are in the, in the model because who knows, you might be able to get into a group that does the flex raid dungeon and push through. But again, those are different strategies that you're you're having. I sort of already shaded my way towards that where I'm saying, hey, I think it's probably best to go for the legendary cloak. The reason is, is you're guaranteed a legendary cloak. It does take you a bit to go ahead and do that, um, but you pretty much are guaranteed to get that legendary cloak. And again, the, the cloak strategy is more about time put into the game than luck, or uh, and so therefore it gives you a lot more flexibility um, to pursue it. Um, again, you're guaranteed the cloak if you put in the time. Either way, uh, it's going to require lots and lots of time, lots and lots of patience, and lots and lots of luck. <laughs> is sort of what you're is what I'm getting at here with uh, this scenario. So now I'm going to switch it over a little bit, and we're going to sort of show you the math of how do we put all of this in action. So uh, here we have Quappy. Uh, so here's my character. This is what he looks at when he's not wearing his Christmas sweater. And uh, basically uh, what he has is there's a list of all his currently equipped items. So basically all I did is I, I put all this into a spreadsheet and said, okay, because I like spreadsheets, I went ahead and I said, okay, let's add everything up. We have 8696. My current item level is, is average item level is, is 543. So that's currently where I'm at with Coopi. So I'm going to go ahead and switch screens real quick. And this is sort of where I went from there. So here's sort of the, the, uh, the spreadsheet that's here. So we have the currently equipped item. That's right there. And then um, I went with the legendary cloak. So basically this is the build off of the legendary cloak I just explained uh, to everybody in the previous slides. And then what I did is I decided to go, okay, so the easiest way to go ahead and do this would be to look for a variance piece, uh, a piece that would go ahead and would um, figure out what's the difference. In other words, what's the difference between what I'm currently wearing and what I would need to do for the legendary cloak. And so uh, zero means I actually have a piece that meets the requirement. A uh, negative number would mean that the piece I'm currently wearing is lower than the, what I need in the Legendary Cloak. A positive number would mean that the piece I'm currently wearing is higher than the strategy for the cloak. So example here, 
is under the wrist piece. I currently have a 548 wrist piece, but the legendary cloak model, I only needed a 543 piece. And so now I'm starting to get positive negative numbers and I'm having lots of fun here. And now I start going into offsets. And what I mean by offsets are obviously positive numbers can offset negative numbers. Yay! So an example would be here where I have a 16 score. I am, I am 16 um, item levels higher uh, what I currently have versus what I needed for the legendary cloak set. So that 16, I can take 12 of that and I can offset this 12, um, 12 item level you know, you know, deficit when it comes to this ring. I have a, a 536 ring versus a, a 548 uh, ring needed. So those are things that I can go ahead and do there. So basically what I come up with is if I take, uh, what, here's your check. Your check should be this. If you take your total item level that you currently are wearing and then you subtract that from the 8800 that you need to get to the 550 uh, level, basically you should get a number. And that number should equal the sum of all your variances. When you add up all your variances. And for me, for Kawapi, that magic number was 104. So I'm 104 item levels lower than what I needed to do. So I, okay, so let's figure out what it is. <clears throat> so next up, what I came up with is looking and saying, okay, let's figure out where I need to be. So I start off here where basically what you have is you have your um, my final item. So I carried over everything that had a zero offset or a positive uh, variance. I moved over into this final items slot right here. And then basically what I did is I went ahead and uh, primarily just went ahead and just started listing all the yeses. So everything here that says equipped, that means yes, I'm currently wearing it. So these are all my positive variances and zero variances. Next up, what I did was, okay, and then I went, okay, so where do I need to make stuff? Obviously, the easiest place to go was start putting in pieces that I didn't have. So I went back to the model for the legendary cloak. Oh, I need a 608 piece here. Okay, boom. So that was an easy one to fill out. Okay, look, I'm missing the hands. So I need the 561 hands. Okay, look, I'm, I'm missing a ring here. So I need to get a 543 ring. So I go ahead and put that in there. Um, next up, I, I look at this and I say, okay, so where's the, my next area to go? Okay, trinket. Uh, okay, so I can go ahead and uh, put the trinket here because I currently don't have a trinket. Uh, I only have a 536 trinket. I needed a 548 trinket. And so then you start adding it up. And so for the neck piece, I, I don't have, I have a 528 neck piece. I need to get to 539 to get my magic number. So uh, that would be the timeless aisles. And then what you do is you come up with the variances over here. So again, this variance here is the difference between what I'm currently wearing and what I need for the final item list. So uh, then I just went through this and uh, basically I have the the numbers of where everything is. I found out that I need to only have um, five pieces that are necessary for me to go ahead and do that. And so that's what I did with Kawapi. So again, add up all the item levels, figure out what the total item level amount is, subtract that from 8,800. It tells you how many more points you have to go. And then basically, I started looking through that spreadsheet and I came up with a strategy. So for Kawapi, I have to go ahead and get the Legendary Cloak. So I have a lot of running to do. Um, also, the other thing about it is I need to run the Celestials. So go ahead and every week I need to go in with Kawapi and look to get those gloves to get the upgrade, the 553 gloves. Uh, then I also need to run the Timeless Isles to get a neck token and be able to upgrade that uh, once because I only need to get that up to um, the basically the the the, the five sorry the 549. So um, the, um, those are things that you can go ahead and the 539. So I have to actually add a um, sorry add a timeless a timeless uh, burden of turning to it. Then I need to run LFR, or I should say, then I need to go ahead and I need to run um, Flex Raids to get a 540 trinket. And then 
I need to go ahead and I need to upgrade that 535 ring I have. I need to upgrade that twice. So to basically go ahead and summarize, I need a legendary cloak. I need to get a celestial gloves. I need to get a Thomas Isle token. I need to get a 540 trinket that I don't already have. And I need to go ahead and I need to do nine upgrades for 250 Valor Points, which means I need to go out and earn 2250 Valor Points to go ahead and meet the strategy. So those are just sort of the, one of the ways that you sort of build it up. Now, another version I have on this is, is, is Konoshiki, looking at Konoshiki. Um, very similar mathematics that I did uh, on the spreadsheet. Uh, previously, I won't go through that as much, but basically the same thing. I took what she currently had. I added them all up. Uh, basically went ahead and figure out her total. Her magic number is is 8624. Uh, so she's currently at 8624. I'm sure she's got better gear since then. Um, and it needs to be up to, to 8800. So she has 176 points to go. So basically for her, um, the strategy for her would be, at least my, my analysis of her strategy, and she could disagree, is would be also getting the Legendary Cloak, uh, upgrading it twice. That would give her uh, 78 uh, item level points for doing that. So a big chunk of change there. Uh, then she had to run Celestials to get the 553 legs, because she already has the belt, a belt and a handpiece. And then upgrade that twice to get the 561. That would give her an additional 25 points. She then needs to run LFR for the 528 shoulders and upgrade those twice. That would give her plus 26 points. Uh, she'd then have to go ahead and run Timeless Isles for a neck token and get a Burden of Eternity. And that would go ahead and upgrade that twice. So that would give her 7 points. She'd also have to get a 540 Trinket and upgrade it twice to get 18 points. And she'd need to get a 540 Ring uh, twice. So she need to get two 540 Rings. And then she'd have to upgrade it. Um, then, lastly, not least, we'd have uh, she'd have to run the Timeless Isles for the Wrist Token and a Burden of Eternity, and upgrade that twice for seven more points. So to wrap it all up, she'd need to get the Legendary Cloak, the Celestial 553 Legs, uh, some version of 528 LFR Shoulders, uh, a Timeless Isle Neck Token, a Timeless Isle Wrist Token, two Burdens of Eternity, and a Partridge in a Pear Tree. Again, uh, 540 Trinkets and Rings. Uh, and then she'd have to do 14 upgrades at, at 250 Valor Points each for, for 3,500 Valor Points. So that, in a nutshell, is how she would go ahead and get to 550. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Kay to talk about some discussion points uh, and, some, and to see, as always, if you guys have questions, make sure you post them in the shifter discussion. Okay, what I'm going to show you now is it, just bas basically the mathematics <laughs> um, for the Common Core for the State Standards Initiative, and and this is what I'll be looking at right now is the one is the one for high school. Now um, I'm at a community college, and we uh, for the state of Colorado we have our own um, Common Core numbering system that tells us what we need to do. So at the community college level, we're doing something similar to this, but. When we've been looking at this, we've been looking at mathematics, and we scroll all the way down to the high school one, and where we've been finding that you can go and align this. And remember, our quest line was not to give you basically a, a textbook list of here's problems you can do in WoW. It was really so that you would know where the math is happening, especially the higher level math. Not the lower level, below level 20 math, but the higher, <laughs> the higher level math that WoW um, players use uh, on a daily basis. So if you go into high school, where we found it is we found um, we really like the modeling. And we like it, and we like it so much better than that. Um, here's why. Playing a table tennis tournament for seven players at a club with four tables, where each player plays against each other. You know, examples of situations. Well, guess what? We think that you, we can have, if you have your students embedded in WOW, you can be giving these, them these math problems all the time, and they can be figuring, this, uh, figuring these out. So we think analyzing stopping distance for a car, analyzing risks in situations as, as extreme sports, pandemics, and terrorism, relating population statistics to individual predictions. We think that you can really go in 
and you can make the math, the embedded math, hit the common core and that you can pull it out and you can go ahead and align it. Yeah, just a really quick aside for that. I mean, it's, it's not just in World of Warcraft, but it's a lot of other MMORPGs also have the same math behind it. But another quick example you could have, I was, I was just listening to talking about the, the mathematical model going, well, here's something you have in WoW. Um, some people try to go ahead and do an achieve, which basically uh, gives them an achievement for falling uh, 65 uh, feet or greater in-game and surviving. And so that's a mathematical problem. How far can you fly up off the ground uh, and still survive when you land based on the number of hit points you have. And so you can actually have your students build out a model for that and, and build out a simulation to figure out how much how high they can fly. So I mean that's another way you can you can play around with it. Nothing we didn't talk about that in any quest line, but like I said, we're just trying to sort of sort of say, here's where math lives in World of Warcraft and it's up to you as the instructor to sort of go in and go, okay, so what specific pieces do I want to pull out? Okay, and besides the modeling, here, here's the other place we love. Statistics and probability. Okay, making inferences and justifying conclusions. Conditional probability, using probability to make decisions. And, and here's the thing, a game lots of times will not give you the exact probability. They don't like to give out their algorithms. Okay, but at the same point in time, the reason we had you do the quest line on the meta sites was so you could see the meta sites out there where people were starting to do the reporting on there. And think about it for your students in doing math or in doing embedded wow about them being able to go out to the meta sites, out to the larger meta game, figuring out where to find that information and then bringing it back. You also there have information and technology fluency in there also. But here's here's some of the examples that you can see. <laughs> um, calculate expected values, use them to solve problems, use probability to evaluate outcomes of decisions. Here's a, here's a nice one. Find the expected payoff for a game of chance. For example, find the expected winnings from a, a state lottery ticket or a game at a fast food restaurant. Guess what? Um, you can do that with World of Warcraft and actually it's a lot more complex than trying to fi figure, figure that out. Okay. And your students can be doing this with their classmates, with other players, in a guild of mathomancers or mathematicians or, or statisticians who are figuring this out. I mean, for me, that's a part of the beauty of, of World of Warcraft, okay? Um, there's quest lines, and you'll have people talk about the literature and the story and developing the backstory for your character. For me, it's where is this math? Where is this statistics? How can I figure out what the probability of, the, of this happening? How do I optimize? How do I go to the next step? I know what the number should be. How do I get there? And that is using mathematics on a daily basis. And, and actually, the New Media Consortium just came out with their preview for 2014. And one of the things they're talking about is the quantified self, meaning how are you using math on a daily basis? to improve yourself. So, so I mean, that's a little thing that's out there that's kind of cutting edge, but this is where y your students can be using math on a daily basis in a class, and this can be embedded. Think about how different your math or your stats class, or um, we, we do business statistics class, could look if you're using something that's like a simulation like this, a a as opposed to, to some of the other publisher options that you might have. All right, that was awesome. So uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, as always, thank you to the Inevitable Trail Guild for hosting us and uh, serving as a refuge for our uh, quest liners. So thank you all for uh, working in the, in the quest line and for uh, answering our questions, and uh, thanks for watching. So have a great holiday season, and uh, we will see you online. Bye.